Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Caroline Norbury. I'm the Chief Exec of Creative UK, and I'm delighted to welcome the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Keir Starmer MP, this evening. So thank you so much, Keir, for joining this year's Creative Coalition Festival. Um, and I know that you're going to share with us, and I think this is the, the first time actually as leader that you're going to share this, your vision for the UK's creative industries. Um, and for the for those of you in the audience who um, want to know how this is going to run, we're going to ask here to to give a short speech, and then we've been we've crowdsourced a number of questions from different creative practitioners and leaders um, across the country. Uh, so um, so please uh, sit down. And I'm sorry we were running just a tiny bit late, but um, I think we're going to have a really really interesting discussion this evening. So. Um, in my opening festival speech, I highlighted that beyond money and jobs, uh, creative businesses, creative practitioners and creative skills can deliver on something that's really, truly ambitious, not just a return to the pre pandemic normal, but a far more innovative, sustainable and frankly equitable economy. After all, we're an ideas economy and I can promise you that this sector is not short of ideas at all. And, and many of the panels and sessions during this festival so far have illustrated how committed this industry is to new models. But there are a number of things that we've all acknowledged that hold us back from achieving that ambition. Um, amongst them are a lack of security in freelance work, the sidelining of creative in education and an, an underinvestment in the people, places and institutions that are there to spread that opportunity and wealth. So ensuring that these opportunities and challenges are addressed in general election manifestos is going to be vital. And we're going to be working very hard as your sector champions to, um, to, 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 to pull those ideas together, to champion the sector and, and hold government to account. So we're, we're delighted, Keir, that you're able to, to join us. And um, without further delay, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, uh, thank you, Caroline. And, and good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here, as Caroline has said, actually talking to you for the first time. And, and can I be clear from the start, I really don't want this to be a one off. Um, I want it to be the beginning of a conversation that we can keep coming back to, that you could feed into and exchange it. And as I was planning this talk, I was reflecting on how lucky we are. We live in a country with a cultural heritage stretching back thousands of years our literature, our art, music, theatre, advertising and fashion are admired all over the world. We have a truly national culture maintained by universal public broadcasting. And 2022 will be a big year to celebrate that culture. It's Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The Women's Euros are here. Birmingham will host the Commonwealth Games and the BBC will celebrate a centenary of its creation. But as great as they are, I'm not here just to celebrate the cultural achievements of the past. Instead, I want to look at the, the source of this heritage, which is our creativity as a nation. Creativity allows us to see the world in entirely new ways. Let me give you an example. We saw it in The Scientists at Oxford developing the vaccine to the coronavirus. And that was every bit as much as we see it in our great paintings, actors, and our musicians. So my focus today is not just on what are known in policy circles as the creative industries. I want to widen the conversation to talk about our creative nation, because I believe that all good industry is creative. To be creative is the economic necessity of our times. Creativity brings beauty and meaning into our lives, but it's also the source of innovation and invention. It's the expression of talent and imagination. It's the key to the security, the prosperity, and the respect that our country needs. And, and nowhere is this more in evidence than in the creative industries themselves. At the beginning of this year, I set out my contract with the British people. Its objective was the creation of a new Britain 
in which people can get the security, the prosperity, and the respect they deserve. What I want to do today is to fill in the details of this contract to give you a sense of how those values will make us an even more creative nation. I'll talk about how Labour will work in partnership with you to provide security to a creative workforce, to bring prosperity to the nation, and to restore respect to the industry and creative communities across the nation. The first term in my contract with the British people is security. Labour is committed to providing security for working people in every sector. And as you know better than I, the creative industries were left particularly exposed by the pandemic. Output in the creative industries declined by more than a third between 2019 and 2021. That's partly, of course, because beyond Britain's renowned creative brands, there are legions of small businesses, micro businesses and freelancers who depend for a living on the success of those brands. A third of creative workers are freelancers. That's double the UK average. That rises to seven in 10 workers in music and the performing and visual arts. And the pandemic left many people in those industries insecure and short of support. And sadly, 110,000 jobs were lost. And if Britain is to recover strongly from the pandemic, the creative industries must thrive. We need your entrepreneurial spirit, your ability to navigate and embrace change. We need you to feel safe, to take risks. We need your ideas and innovation. In return for that, the government should provide you with the security to do so. The decade of this Conservative government, though, has let you down badly. Economic growth has slowed. The cost of living has risen faster than earnings. And this makes it harder to build new businesses. So Labour would unleash the entrepreneurial spirit so evident in the creative industries with our plan for 100,000 startups across the country. Sadly, today, the British economy is increasingly defined by insecure work and low pay. The government I lead would deliver the security at work that you need and you deserve. We would raise the minimum wage to £10 an hour. We would give workers full rights from day one. We would ban zero hour contracts and we would increase statutory sick pay to make it available to everybody. In addition, we have a 10 point plan to live well with COVID, preventing the need for future restrictions. And that would give the creative industry security from the threat of cancellation. We will not prosper if we're not secure. Security and prosperity work together. And the second term in my contract is prosperity. Under my leadership, Labour is back in business. We will equip the next generation for work and we'll invest to create high-skilled jobs. In response, we expect each sector to invest in the long term too. We expect businesses to contribute to the aim of net zero. And we expect them to be good local citizens by supporting their workforces with fair pay and flexible working. Labour believes Britain's future prosperity lies with its homegrown industries. And the creative industries are a great British success story. In 2019, for instance, they contributed, if you can believe it, over £100 billion in gross value added to the UK economy. Now, that's greater than the aerospace, automotive, life sciences, and oil and gas sectors combined. And that's not all. These industries supported a further £62.1 billion across the supply chain. There are 2 million jobs in the creative sector, and a further 1.4 million rely on it. 
and creative activity is, of course, nationwide. Some of Britain's most famous characters, James Bond, Harry Potter, were brought to life in Pinewood Studios in Buckinghamshire through the acknowledged excellence of our film crews, technicians and set builders. The UK theatre industry is world beating. Our productions are in huge demand and our West End regional theatres and community arts are envied worldwide. We have world leading 3D capture technology at Dimension Studios in London. The UK gaming industry has evolved into the UK's most lucrative entertainment sector and is the leading video game market in Europe. More than 1500 people are employed in the industry in its birthplace in Dundee. And in 2020, the universities of Abate, Dundee and St Andrews announced the launch of a £9 million gaming research and development centre in the city. The University of Reading's Thames Valley Science Park is soon to become the UK's biggest film studio, creating 3,000 jobs. There are studio developments underway in Cardiff, in Northern Ireland, in Yorkshire, Manchester and Scotland. The creative industries are growing four times the rate of the UK economy as a whole. Their gross value added has grown by over a third in the Northwest and almost a half in Scotland over the last decade. The creative industries are creating jobs at three times the UK average. Employment in the sector grew by 21% in Northern Ireland and 30% in the West Midlands between 2010 and 2017. And we're exporting the fruits of our creativity too. The creative industries account for 12% of total UK exports. And that creativity enhances Britain's international reputation. It attracts investors and visitors. But leaving the EU does, of course, pose challenges. There is, for a start, a potential loss of funding. Between 2014 and 2020, the UK received 68 million euros in funding from Creative Europe. And we will lose funds such as Erasmus+, Plus, Europe for Citizens, and the European Structural and Investment Funds. In addition, EU citizens are a significant part of the UK's creative industries workforce. Creative professionals need to be able to travel abroad at speed. So the impact on them has been particularly tough, with musicians especially hard hit. And the Conservatives believed it was enough to get Brexit done. It's not. We urgently need to make Brexit work. So we would push for a visa waiver for touring artists. And we would negotiate an EU-wide cultural touring agreement, including allowances for cabotage, carnets and customs rules. And it's only when we achieve security and prosperity that we will be paying the creative industries the respect that they are properly due. Respect is the third term in my contract with the British people. Every village, town and city in Britain has a sense of identity. And nothing creates more civic pride than a cinema, a museum, a theatre, a gallery or a concert hall. Creativity has driven the regeneration of so many of our towns, cities, and our regions. Margate, for instance, home of the Turner Contemporary, attracts 2.9 million visitors and generates 68 million for the local economy. In Folkestone, the Creative Quarter has regenerated the area with arts, creative industries, and education. And of course, in Scotland, we have the world's largest international arts festival, the Edinburgh Festival. 
the Edinburgh Festival, as many of you will know firsthand, is the launch pad for creatives across the country, indeed across the world, who bring their performances and new works to the city. And Scottish TV productions, like Outlander, are exported across the world, helping to promote jobs in the media and make Britain such a world leader in TV production. The UK video effects industry thrives in Cardiff Bay with successful businesses like Bait Studio. And Creative UK launched the Culture and Creative Investment Programme in the Northeast. And we need to look after our national culture too. The UK's public service broadcasting is a national treasure because it is also local and global, local news. The World Service, the BBC and Channel 4 are the narrators of our national story. They create jobs and drive productivity. The Conservatives threaten the future of these two great institutions. The plan to privatise Channel 4 and the threat to BBC as we know it are a direct attack on some of the best of Britain's creative work. There will be an economic press to pay to. Just yesterday, the Secretary of State announced £50 million of investment for the creative industries. But the privatisation of Channel 4 would put £2.1 billion of gross value added to the supply chain at risk over the next 10 years. It risks putting 60 UK production companies out of business, and showing that the government just isn't interested in growth. Meanwhile, a commercial BBC would rob us and the world, not only of superb news services with unparalleled local knowledge, but a valuable cultural export. And I want to challenge all of you here today and the wider sector to be bold, to come together and assert your collective clout, speaking out in defence of the value of public sector broadcasting against the government's attacks. And I promise you this, you can do so knowing that a government I lead will always have your back. Our record in government on creativity and culture speaks for itself. The last Labour government oversaw a boom in creative industries and institutions. Tate Modern opened in 2000. The Eden Project in Cornwall in 2001. The Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art on the Quayside in Newcastle opened in 2002. And the Sage Gateshead Concert Hall opened in 2004. In Salford, meanwhile, Media City UK began life in 2006. And the next Labour government will help the creative industries flourish again. Creative roles now make up a significant part of the government's shortage occupation list. And they include many of the jobs predicted to grow as a share of the workforce by 2030. And as I tour the country, I'm frequently struck by how often I'm told about the skills shortage. A recent survey showed that 80% of businesses were worried about skills. In this context, the government's squeeze on creative subjects in curriculums is self-harming. Even STEM industries say that the stripping away of vital creative subjects, including drama, music, and art, is costing them. Even primary aged children have seen an almost 40% decline in participation in music activities. Not only does this affect access to careers in the performing arts, it also further degrades the creativity upon which our national prosperity rests. The skills gap in the creative industries workforce aren't being filled by the available training. Funding per student in further education and sixth form colleges has fallen by 11% in real terms since Labour was last in government. Digital skills are another form, another area where the UK needs to improve. 
but fewer than half of employees have the skills they need, particularly in young people. So in government, we would add digital skills to the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And last year, we launched our Council of Skills Advisors. David Blunkett, a former education secretary, will work alongside the tech entrepreneur, Prafil Nagand, the skills expert, Rachel Sandby Thomas, and Kevin Rowan of the TUC. And in government, we would ensure that everyone leaves education ready for work and ready for life. The reputation of the creative nation depends on it. Prosperity, security, and respect. The three terms of my contract with the British people. A Labour government would extend this contract to the creative industries. You've achieved so much, but to succeed as a country, we will need more creativity than ever before. I want us to become an even more creative nation, a nation defined by its willingness to take risks and embrace change. Creativity can make us more prosperous as a country, and it can bring meaning, beauty, and pride to every village, town and city. It can give people opportunities to flourish, the security they need to do so, and the respect they deserve. Together, we can build the creative nation of which we can all be proud. Let's keep this conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Keir. So lots of... Um... Lots of detail there, actually, some meat, some, some, some interesting, interesting things to get, get into. So we've got about 15 minutes. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we have gone out and asked our, some of our members and uh, crowdsourced some questions. So if you're OK, I'm just going to I'm just going to read out some of those questions that have been put to us and keen to hear. Yeah, by all means. Yeah, yeah. Views. Great. Thank you. So our first question is from Yasin El Ashrafi, who is the managing director of Leicester based HQ Recording. And uh, my notes tell me it's also his birthday today. So oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Yasin. Um, anyway, Yasin's question is, um, Kia, how do you propose we can improve funding opportunities for creatives grassroots music and arts organisations and practitioners to help them enable more creatives from diverse and deprived backgrounds to strive for and achieve careers in the creative sector. And Yassine's well, business is a, is a community-based um, music business, so a bit of context there. Well, uh, firstly, Yassine, thank you so much for raising this in our very first question, because diversity, of course, in all sectors is crucial. And Access um, should be based on um, talent and hard work. Um, but at the moment, there are actually too many barriers. And you will know that. And uh, many of those um, on this conference call will know that. Um, now, obviously, we've got the Cultural Recovery Fund, and, and that's welcome. Um, but it's hard for groups to access. And it wasn't open, I don't think, to individuals. Um, so I propose we also make apprentice, apprenticeship opportunities more flexible um, and secure access for everyone to careers, guidance, work experience and extracurricular skills. And I think that takes me back to what I was saying about schools and the need to broaden the curriculum because at the moment um, it's far, far too narrow and, and we will never, I think, track the, this issue of access and diversity until we tackle it um, at the very earliest stage, which is at our schools and our colleges um, and going into the sector in the first place. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Um, our next question is from um, Sir, Sir Alistair Spaulding, um, CBE, who's the Artistic Director and Chief Executive of Sadler's Wells. And Alistair asks, um, as you may know, funding to the Arts Council of England National Portfolio Organisations has remained on standstill for every year since 2010, which is in effect a cut of over 20% in real terms. 
how would a Labour administration seek to restore levels of funding to the subsidised sector if you were to win the next election? Well, um, Alistair, look, again, thank you for that question. And funding is a, a real cause of concern. And, and that figure you give from 2010 onwards um, is very, very significant. Um, as you say, no increase amounting uh, to a 20% cut in real terms. I mean, the first thing I would say um, is judges on our record. And I'm very proud of what we did when we were last in government. That's why, Caroline, I listed uh, some of those achievements in the remarks I made just now. And you, just going through the list, I think you can see how seriously and how important the last Labour government thought that creative, the creative sector was and, and funding it. So I'm proud of that record. We have the same ambition going in to government, which we hope will be the case in a year or two. Um, now, I'm not going to make um, funding and spending commitments now. Rachel Rees, our shadow chancellor, has been very clear about fiscal rules. But um, I do recognise your industry as an important economic driver uh, and a real lever to deliver prosperity for all of us. Um, and, you know, at the moment we're getting in stuck in a sort of high tax, low growth economy. And our ambition is to turn that around and, and funding for the creative sector will be part of that. And that's why, Caroline and Alistair, what I said at the beginning was particularly important to me, which is to see the creative sector as, as more than just the sort of traditionally defined uh, creative industries, if you like, but to see it as a major driver of our economy and, and, and see the creativity in everything that we do. So thank you, Alistair, for that question. Thank you. I, th I think you, 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 you mentioned in your, um, in your address uh, how important creativity was for uh, businesses that were, um, were could be described as STEM heavy, um, and you also mentioned and, and you also mentioned that the um, the feedback that you've had as you've travelled around the country around the sort of skill shortages that we're that we're facing now and and absolutely what you describe completely um, is reflected in many of the conversations that we have not just with players in the creative industries but also actually the leaders of businesses in manufacturing uh, in engineering in design businesses and so on so um, and our next question is from uh, Philippa Childs who's head of BEC2 which is the trade union for um, crew working in film television broadcasting theatre and live arts and and her question is around skills so um, she says even as Omicom's Omicron's devastating impact on the UK's creative industries begins to wane a chronic skills crisis threatens to cri cripple many parts of the sector Skilled and experienced staff are leaving the industry in large numbers as a result of low pay and long hours. This is a sector that has ex endured extreme hardship over the last two years with little government support, yet does so much to enrich our lives with creativity. What are your plans to address the skill shortage, reach and retain the next generation of creative workers and secure a resilient future for the creative industries? So in, in your address, <clears throat> you did talk about, you, you know, that second word you used, security. So I think we'd be interested to, um, in your response to Philippa's um, question, just to sort of hear a little bit more about what such security might look like. Yeah, just um, Caroline and Philip are taking, picking up immediately on the security um, aspect. I mean, there's so many aspects of it, but just to take some of the obvious ones. The, fo the first is our plan for living with COVID, which gives a degree of security about what's going to happen in the future. Because, you know, um, I've had so many discussions with those in the creative sector about the huge impact um, of the pandemic in the last two years. I mean, lockdowns, closing down our industry, closing down hospitality and entertainment has had a massive, massive impact. And you don't need me um, to tell you that. So the first thing is a secure plan for living with um, COVID. Um, the second is uh, what I mentioned in my remarks, which is uh, better security for those working in the sector. Um, I'm really struck, and again, I have many, many conversations um, uh, of the plight of those in the creative sector who were uh, either self-employed and therefore didn't qualify in one shape or form for some of the support packages that the government put in place, um, and many people were caught in that way. Those that didn't have um, any form of proper statutory sick pay and therefore 
um, were really struggling in terms of self-isolation. So the security of knowing um, that there are day one employment rights within the sector is very, very um, important. I think there's a wider issue because in a sense underlying Philip's question is this sense that the insecurity has meant people leaving the sector and we don't have the skills coming into backfill, which is um, a sort of double whammy, if you like. And that's why what I said about skills, I think, is so important. And I've been really struck by this issue of skills because on the one level, there's the creative skills in their own right and for their own worth, drama, art, music, whatever it may be. But there's also the wider argument that many, many businesses that you wouldn't call creative businesses um, say what we're not getting from young people um, coming into the labour market are the sort of skills you need to be able to work in a team, to work as a group, um, to um, you know, understand um, and have conversations uh, that get things done. So they're, in many respects, not so much looking for technical skills, um, they're looking for the sort of skills that the creative industry, the creative sector can give. Art and music. I, mean, I, I <coughs> uh, was a musician when I was growing up. I went to the Guildhall School of Music. Um, that was wonderful. But what it taught me was how to work with groups of three or four other people or in an orchestra where you're working as, a, as well as enjoying playing music. You're working as a team. You're understanding how to work with other individuals. And so many businesses say to me, you know, that's among the things that they're really, really looking for. So I think there's a huge amount we can do here. David Blunkett is going to lead for us on this really big piece of work, which is what do we really need in our curriculum to make sure that children and young people coming out of school and college have the skills they actually need for life and for work? So it's a bit of a long answer, um, but it's a very important issue. Agreed. I would say that... Um... <laughs> through the discussions we've been having, not just with our members who are numerous and, um, and impressive, but, but also, as I said, our engagement with, with many other in, industrial sectors, this issue of creativity in education and really stemming the, this or stopping this, um, the hammering out of creativity from the curriculum, I would say is probably, um, one of the most important issues for the sector. So um, thank you very much for, for, for addressing that, that head on. And uh, it sounds like you're listening. Um, the next question comes from Amanda Maxwell, who's a music manager, and she's also founder of Freelance Queens. I think you've touched on this before already a little bit, but I, in the interest of fairness, I need to, to share it really. Um, so Amanda asked, what a Labour government in comparison to other governments might do to ensure that freelance work is genuinely sustainable and secure? Um, so we've just talked a little bit about the security point, um, but I think we're, we're really keen to perhaps hear from you around um, this issue of sick pay, maternity pay, but also, um, you know, whether or not, you know, what does a new compact look like for the sector between government, this our workforce, and then the, the bigger businesses that, that, that you refer to? Yeah, well, look, thank you for that, because, um, you know, being a freelancer or self-employed obviously has the benefit of great flexibility um, and, you know, ability to do different things in different ways in different times. And, and that can be fantastic but he's incredibly insecure. And I, I think that the pandemic um, flushed that out um, very, very clearly. And I know that for many people, being a freelancer or self-employed, um, whatever freedom and flexibility it gives you also gives people sleepless nights in terms of actually making ends meet, whether it's going to be enough work. Um, uh, and, and, and then the longer term issues, I suppose, about pensions, etc. Now, in our green paper, which I referred to on employment rights. So what we did was we uh, talked to various sectors, talked to various uh, trade unions about what rights were needed on day one. And we put them in a green paper, um, and which is intended um, as legislation that we would introduce very early in a Labour government. And that deals with some of these issues. Um, for example, um, statutory sick pay, which can be a real problem. I actually do think, Caroline, if I'm, if I'm honest here, there's more that we could do in relation to um, those that are self-employed and, and freelancers. And um, this, I think, is a classic example where we shouldn't treat tonight as a one-off, um, but where we need to keep coming back to it because um, 
we need to know from you, well, what are the sorts of things that would make a difference in addition to what we've got in our green paper that are specifically targeted for those that are freelancers or those that are self-employed who make up a very large um, you know, proportion of our workforce, um, but are, you know, whilst flexible, pretty well uniquely exposed um, when it comes to the risks that they're taking um, and the long-term security that um, they understandably want and need. Well, that's 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 very helpful. Thank you. We do actually have um, a cadre of um, I think we've got about 16 freelance champions who are all people expert in, in their own sort of arts and disciplines um, who've come together to form our freelance champions task force. So um, I would really we would really well, maybe we could follow up with them. That would be really that good. Would be wonderful. Thank you very much. OK, I think we're on our last question because I know that you're a busy man. And you've got to go soon. So um, our final question comes from uh, Jill James, who's head of artistic management at the Edinburgh International Festival. Um, and you've touched uh, in your in your in your address about um, making Brexit work. There we go. There's a new catchy phrase that we're all going to be repeating soon. Um, Anyway, Jill asks, uh, cultural exchange is at the heart of the Edinburgh International Festival. However, Brexit has created significant barriers towards touring, making it nearly impossible for UK based artists. How would you encourage EU partners to implement visa and permit free routes, which you did mention, for touring performers across all member states and the removal of limits on road haulage journeys? Yeah, well, um... Jill, thank you for this. And um, um, as um, Horace at the Musicians Union will attest, he and I have had many, many conversations in the last two years about the very real difficulties that are there for artists, particularly musicians, um, who do, whether it's Edinburgh or elsewhere, need to move across borders quickly, um, sometimes in a predictable way, sometimes not if you need a stand in in a hurry. Um, and leaving the EU has made life very, very difficult for them. And I don't think it's good enough to simply say, well, you'll have to lump it. Um, you know, we, we're out of the EU now. Um, and that's why in the remarks I made a moment ago, I gave as an example um, the um, sort of visa waiver that we would look for for those in the creative sector so that you could move across a border at speed. Um, obviously, um, you know, taking instruments and things with you as necessary um, because otherwise I, for parts of the sector um, and musicians would be um, a good example of this it is really difficult to thrive I mean you don't really need me to say that but it's really this is a major part of what it means to be in the creative sector so um, we would go down the visa waiver um, route we would actually also try to negotiate um, an agreement with the EU for the creative sector that understands and addresses this concern because, you know, the ability of, uh, of those in the creative sector to go quickly across borders, musicians to go and play concerts and gigs in other countries is fantastically important for them. It's the export of something we're brilliant at and it's much craved in other countries. Um, they want, there's no country in Europe that doesn't want um, our creative performers uh, to be there. So um, we, we would, um, you know, one aspect of making Brexit work would be uh, to make those changes. And, um, you know, I think our government is too blinkered. It thinks that because, because we've got Brexit done in the sense that we're out of the EU, then it's job done and we don't need to look at some of the very obvious problems that are risen. These are obvious problems. I do think they're fixable. Um, we probably need a further, I've got a pretty good angle on the problem for musicians. There may be other problems for others who cross the border frequently and at speed. Um, and again, Caroline, that's probably one of those that we should come back to in crafting um, precisely how we would uh, look at this. But um, it's a real problem. It requires a real solution. And we're completely up for that conversation, completely up with having a conversation with the EU. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keir. Sorry, you, you've frozen. I'm hoping that you can still hear me. Um, 
Yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay, then. So thank you so much. And thank you also for your offer of this being an ongoing conversation. This festival grew out of um, the convening of the sector that we brought together two, two, over two years ago now at the, at the outbreak outset of the pandemic. And we, um, we brought around 650 people together for a sort of a month of different sorts of conversations and the festival grew out of that. So that sense of keeping that keeping those conversations going of being alive to how we can between us all shape better policy and shape better practice is um, is in, integral and intrinsic in everything that we do so we will definitely take up your offer of this being an ongoing conversation um, and um, and and until then um, I just want to say thank you so much to Sakir Starmer um, for your for your time this this evening um thank you so much for your thoughts it's great to have everything laid out like this there will be lots of people pouring over your over the content of what you said um and i'm sure it will spark lots and lots and lots of conversations in the sector and thank you very much to the audience this evening for joining us and um i think we've got we're still running i think we've still got another session after this um and then um and then tomorrow we've got another action-packed day so for me well, thank you very much for having me and as i say I'd very much like to see this as the beginning of a conversation. There's so much more that we've got to talk about. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.